Hi, I'm Lydia McGrew. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where we are making common sense rigorous. This evening I'm going to be recording a somewhat longer video where I'm talking about a book in Yohinian Studies. This is the first video that I've recorded since my trailer for The Eye of the Beholder, which came out recently. And I decided to depart a little bit from my usual practice of talking about evangelical New Testament scholars to talk about a mainstream New Testament scholar. The video I'm recording now here is about a book called Theology and History in the Fourth Gospel, written by Jörg Frey, published in 2018 by Baylor University Press. Even though it was published by Baylor University Press, I think it's quite clear that Professor Fry is not an evangelical scholar. He's, I think, would be more fairly called a mainstream scholar. He teaches at the University of Zurich, Switzerland, and he uh, takes a number of evangelical scholars to task for thinking that there is more historicity to the fourth gospel, John's gospel, than he believes that there is. So, for example, Andreas Kostenberger, D.A. Carson, Craig Blomberg, and the late Leon Morris, he refers to all of these as apologists, and he, he means that, I think it's quite clear, as a criticism. In fact, uh, he says that he believes they are operating under an a prioristic assumption of the historicity of the fourth gospel. As we proceed, uh, I think it will become evident that it's actually Professor Fry who is operating an, under an a prioristic assumption of the at least partial fictional nature of the fourth gospel and that he does not appear to be open to evidence to the contrary, though he does not realize that. So I want to start with a quotation from chapter 2, which contains various methodological statements in theology and history in the fourth gospel. And it's a very interesting statement. Fry lists a bunch of the facts that John gets right throughout this chapter, both before and after this quotation that I'm about to read. He lists the things that Leon Morris points to, that uh, D.A. Carson and uh, these folks point to, that I have pointed to, as showing the historical, fully historical intention of the author of the fourth gospel. But he rejects that argument, and this is what he says. Thus, even if the fourth gospel displays numerous histori historiographical devices and elements of authentication, this cannot prove the claim of a more accurate historical reference. Although place names and information about the time of certain events or other narrative details strongly contribute to anchoring John's story as a factual account in the real world of Jesus, these elements do not necessitate that the information provided is historically accurate information, since they can also be fictional elements introduced with the intention of crafting a credible story. So, of course, words like prove and necessitate are, to some extent, a red herring. We all ought to know that these are probabilistic historical arguments. Certainly, Professor Fry uh, can't prove his own views on these matters, so I think words like prove and necessitate should be set aside. It's clear that what he means is that these cannot even strongly support this. And he makes that clear everywhere where he discusses it. Even if there's all of this authentic information. An example of how he applies this principle concerns the meeting of the Sanhedrin in John, uh, toward the end, in John after the resurrection of Lazarus, where they meet and they say, what are we going to do? The whole world is going after this man. And Caiaphas says it is uh, fitting that one man should die for the people and so forth. Fry says, well, in John, we don't get much detail later on when Jesus is actually before the Sanhedrin of Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin. We get more detail of that in Mark. So he says what John has done is that he has uh, moved <laughs> a discussion of what went on before the Sanhedrin and has essentially made up that scene, crafted that scene to sort of correspond to Mark's later scene of Jesus' actual trial before the Sanhedrin. Of course, in John, Jesus isn't before them at that time. They're just consulting about what to do when uh, Jesus hasn't even been arrested yet. But he says, and then he leaves 
it blank later. He doesn't really talk about Jesus' trial before Caiaphas because he already used that material. So that shows the kind of literary theory that he uses. But at the same time, he admits that the setting in John with Annas as, as the um, father-in-law of Caiaphas and still exerting influence and Caiaphas being the high priest that year and the relationship between the Jewish and the Roman authorities is highly realistic. He completely admits that. And he says that essentially this is just what John is doing to make his narrative appear credible. And that's what he says. It can be just something he's doing to make his narrative appear credible. Of course, can can be used for anything. No matter how trustworthy my friend appears to be, I can say, well, that just can be something he's doing to set me up and he's going to cheat me next week. So that's a way of closing yourself off to evidence. Part of what seems to be influencing Fry is a very mistaken notion of the literary genres available to John at the time. In fact, he, he goes so far as to say that, well, ancient authors were encouraged to add all kinds of realistic details in order to add credibility to their stories, even though they were making them up. He does not cite clearly an original source. He names Lucian, but he doesn't say how Lucian is supposedly advocating very detailed, highly realistic historical fiction. And in fact, Lucian doesn't advocate that. He cites secondary sources and he seems to just be under a misimpression about literary history that hyper-realistic fiction was a known genre at the time, which it simply was not. This has been attested to by uh, other secondary authors, not just me. Leon Morris emphasizes this, C.S. Lewis emphasizes this, and all you have to do is go look at a history of the, the realistic novel to find out that, that it did not exist at the time where you would have all of these extremely detailed and obscure, even obscure place names and detailed knowledge of sort of the cultural atmosphere of the time. But Fry has apparently gotten the idea that they actually had that genre. And so then he thinks that it's plausible that John is in it. And so then no matter what comes up, well, that could just be something he's adding to make his tale appear credible. The fact that this might actually make John into a deceiver is also not apparently of concern to him. Even in modern times when we have a very realistic novel, it'll say a novel right on the front. Uh, so it's not attempting to confuse people about what it is. I've dealt with many of these genre questions in The Mirror or The Mask, of course. So that's, that's the first problem, is a confusion about literary history. But Fry also just gets, I believe, captivated by literary theories. And I want to give some of his arguments because I think it's useful to see how these arguments work in order to see that they're weak. This is an extremely highly respected Johannine scholar, mainstream Johannine scholar in Europe. And this is the spirit of modern Johannine scholarship and indeed New Testament scholarship. So let me give you some examples of his other arguments that lead him to what I would call this very closed-minded view that no matter how much evidence you get of John's historicity, he's just going to dismiss it. Well, they can also be fictional elements. Fry talks about the fact that you'll hear all the time that Jesus supposedly sounds so different in John and in the synoptics. I have three chapters on that in the eye of the beholder. Please get hold of the book and read them. I talk there as well in the eye of the beholder of, about what I call heads John loses, tails John loses. So heads John loses, oh look, Jesus sounds different in John and the synoptics. John must be significantly non-historical. Tails John loses is, Oh, uh, here are some places, some motifs where Jesus actually talks in John like he talks in the synoptics. Ah, that means that John is modifying other traditions and moving them around and changing them historically. Now, that's very unfair because supposedly we were complaining that Jesus sounds so different. Now, if we find him sounding the same, maybe we should say, oh, maybe he is the same person. Maybe John does know how he talks. Professor Fry plays the heads John loses, tails John loses game all over the place. And so now we're going to talk about the tails John loses part concerning motifs. 
in Hidden in Plain View, I talk about Jesus saying that he must drink the cup. And in Mark and the other synoptics, he, he talks about his crucifixion as the cup. And he asks the sons of Zebedee, are you able to drink of the cup that I will drink of? And then we find in John's gospel, he says, and it's unique to John's gospel, the cup that a father has given me, shall I not drink it? And we find in the um, synoptics, he prays, let this cup pass from me. And then when the people come to arrest him, he says, the cup that the father has given me, shall I not drink it? And one part is in Mark and the other part is in John. This is actually a, a coincidence between them. This shows that Jesus was thinking in those terms on that night and that when they came to arrest him, he realized the father wanted him to drink this cup. Fry instead says, oh, look, there are these motifs from Mark's passion that we find Jesus uttering in different contexts. That must mean that John is ahistorically modifying Mark's passion. The cup is one of them, what I've just talked about. He takes to be evidence against John's historicity when it's actually evidence for. Another such motif, this is, this is perhaps my favorite in his whole argument, uh, concerns the place in Mark where uh, Jesus has just been praying and then he comes back to the disciples and he finds them sleeping and he says, arise, let us go for the one who is betraying me, who is to betray me is near. So he's referring to Judas. Come on, let's go. He's coming to betray me. Then it, in John, we find a little earlier in the same evening when Jesus has been giving his farewell discourse, he um says, arise, let us go. And he has just been saying that the prince of this world, which is the devil, is coming and has no part in him. So in both places, he says, come on, let's get up, let's go. Professor Fry takes this to be a motif which John is moving from Mark to a different place. As if Jesus could not multiple times say, come on, let's get up, let's go. It's astounding. So we have the cup. We have his hour. In both places, he says his hour has come. And in both places, he says, let us arise, let us go. And he refers to someone as coming, an enemy as coming. And here's what Professor Fry says. The references to the motifs of Mark's Gethsemane pericope in three different and quite dispersed contexts can only be explained by the assumption that the evangelist knew Mark's story, but instead of retelling it, he adopted its central motifs and provided a correction or even rejection in accordance with his own Christological insights. And he calls this the most compelling example. So he's saying this can only be explained by the fact that John is changing Mark. Could it not be explained by the fact that Jesus really spoke this way? of his passion? Now he creates a, a, a phony contradiction here for one of these other motifs. In John 12, which is not in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is troubled in spirit and he says, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? But for this hour I was born into the world. Father, glorify thy name. And then in the synoptics, on the night he's to be betrayed, which is several days later, he says in the garden, let this cup pass from me. And Fry believes that this is a correction because in the one place he says, he doesn't ask God to let the cup, the father to let the cup. He says, shall I say, father, save me from this hour? But then he doesn't. And in the other place he says, father, let this cup pass. And this is a correction. Now, just a moment's thought of realistic psychology would show that he could have both of these thoughts in successive uh, I incidents because that your mind would be dwelling on the fact that you were going to be crucified and that this isn't actually a contradiction. But according to Fry, it can only be explained by this assumption that Mark is, that John is changing Mark. Just astonishing. And yet he accuses Blomberg and these others of an a prioristic approach to John's gospel. But it, it gets better. And this leads to the title of today's video. That's not Occam's Razor. After making this argument from what he calls his most compelling example, Fry invokes 
a principle in epistemology known as Occam's razor. Let me dodge back to that reference to it as the most compelling example. If that is the most compelling example, then there isn't a compelling example. Let me read what he says about Occam's razor. If one here applies the theory of Occam's razor, that is, if the explanation with the fewest additional assumptions is to be preferred, the best option is to reckon with Mark as the most basic source, which is then used quite freely. And what he's trying to say is that John had no other source of knowledge besides Mark, that he just took Mark and then he changed Mark all over the place. And he took things like the hour and the cup and uh, the Christ's agony of mind, and he just kind of scattered them around and he crafted all these other uh, settings for them. And he considers that that's an op application of Occam's razor. Now, Occam's razor says, do not multiply entities without necessity. More broadly, it's the idea that you should prefer the simplest hypothesis. But is this the simplest hypothesis? This is rather like saying, well, there are no actual horses, but all of the uh, evidence we think we have for the existence of horses has been created by different people who are trying to make us think that there are horses. You have made your number of animals smaller by eliminating horses, but you have added many, many different hypotheses about all of these deceptions that are taking place. Or suppose we said that Abraham Lincoln didn't exist, but that all of the sources we have are modifications of the stories about George Washington. We've uh, gotten ourselves one fewer president, one fewer uh, uh, in the number of people in the world by eliminating Abraham Lincoln. But does that make our hypothesis the simplest hypothesis? Far from it, because now we still have to have a, accounts for all of the apparent em evidence of Abraham Lincoln, which we're going to place into the conspiracy to make us think that there was an Abraham Lincoln. Similarly, uh, Fry has eliminated a source, which is reality, for John's for John's accounts of these places where Jesus used this language that are different scenes from Mark, he's eliminated all of those out of reality, but then he's just transferred it to a hyper-complex set of what essentially amount to uh, deceptive and fictionalizing theories uh, in the mind of John and intentions in the mind of John. And if you want to say it isn't deceptive, then just let's just go with hyper-realistic fictional intentions in John's mind, which, for all we know, his audience had no way of discerning or discovering. That is not Occam's razor. That is not the simplest hypothesis. He even goes on and says, if John knows Mark, or even writes for readers of Mark, the Johannine narration is at an even greater distance from the historical origins of the Jesus tradition. As a, a famous philosopher is fond of saying, why think a thing like that? John could, of course, know Mark without being further than Mark from the historical origins of the Jesus tradition. Mark could have his, have his knowledge, and John could have his own knowledge, which, if anything, might even be closer in the sense that John could actually be an eyewitness of many of these events. Professor Frey has an, uh, Fry has an a prioristic approach such that he rules that out, and then he uses phrases like, this can only be explained in this way. I wanted to go through this into some detail because you will hear other scholars say some things that sound somewhat similar. Craig Evans, of course, has his Nuggets view from his debate with Bart Ehrman, where he takes all of the evidence of historicity in John and he calls it Nuggets. And there's still this supposed genre question. That's very much what Fry is doing. You will also find uh, Dr. Michael Lacona saying things like, Yohanine scholars find John very difficult and, and problematic, and they discuss the uh, arguments for and against its historicity, and, and yet Lydia McGrew thinks that she's going to uh, give evidence for this reportage model and so forth. And I'm paraphrasing, but this was in one of his videos uh, in summer of 2020, and kind of seemed a little dismissive of my writing a book because how could I stride in confidently where all of these Johannine scholars have all of these doubts and questions. Professor Fry really does represent that kind of mainstream doubt and question about John. The motto of this channel is making common sense rigorous. 
That's what I'm trying to do. And in doing so, I want to show you that you can have confidence that John is historically reliable, even against such scholars as Professor Jörg Fry. Thanks for watching.